Hi, I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Wingate University. Uh, thanks for joining us on Wingate Spotlight today. Today I am joined by Carrie Hefferly, Associate Professor of History at Wingate. And uh, Carrie, we're going to get to know you a little bit today. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Pleasure to be here. So let's start with the most basic question. Where did you come from? Where did you grow up? I was raised in Ontonagon, Michigan, in the okay. far north, right on Lake Superior. And we, we call that the UP, the Upper Peninsula. Okay. And so I am a Uper. You are a Uper. And Upers are very proud. They're a very connected uh, bunch. Yes, yes. We have a common heritage, and it's very different from the Lower Peninsula and, and from the, the trolls who live under the Mackinac Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> very different from Detroit. Yeah. Um, the, the, the hometown, is, that sounds like a Native American word, is it? Or? It is. It's, it's, a, it's a derivative of a Native American word. Um, they, you know, myth has it, it's I lost my bowl. Oh. Uh, don't ask. <laughs> okay. And I think Tom Izzo and Steve Mariucci are both yes. from the UP. Yes. Yeah, they're from, I think, the Iron Mountain area. Okay. All right. So what was growing up in the UP like? Uh, it's a very different place from here. Yes. Very cold most of the year. Um, the summers are the only warm parts. But it's very rural, actually. And um, I lived right a you know, block from the beach right on the river and kind of the conjunction of the river and the lake. Okay. So I was surrounded by water all the year and um, beautiful white sandy beaches, rock cliffs, um, trees, you know, shadowing the beach, very lush and very green. Um, mount, there's mountainous, there's the porcupine mountains are right on our doorsteps, so lots of hiking, um, you know, swimming, those kinds of activities. And it, but it's still a very small town. Yeah. So is this one of those places where it's winter 10 months of the year and summer two months, unfortunately? Or? Yeah, they, we used to get our first snowstorm usually in September. One Labor Day, I remember, we had snow. A little bit, That's but when they still. closed the swimming pools here. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty rotten. And, and every once in a while we get a snow in May or June that just is crushing. <laughs> wow, okay. So you grew up in the UP in Michigan. Uh, what did your parents do? What was your childhood like? Um, my Dad was a bit small businessman. He owned a grocery store when I was really little, and he sold that to invest in a restaurant that he ran um, while, all the while I was in high school. And, and th that restaurant was on, openly open part of the year, so he also was a school bus driver for the, the high school and elementary school. And um, so he did kind of a jack of all trades. Did okay. a lot of different things. My mom had a nursing degree and was a nurse before she married my mom. And then once they had children, she was a stay-at-home um, uh, mom. And she volunteered a lot, though. She ran a, a St. Vincent de Paul store, still runs a St. Vincent de Paul store charity shop for as volunteer work. Wow. So kind of a traditional American story, you know, open up a business and, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Uh, were they lifelong Michigan folks as well? Yeah. They were both born in Ontonagon. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Did you have any siblings? Yes, I have six. I have three wow. brothers and three sisters. <laughs> okay, and where are you placed among the six? I'm number uh, four. Okay, so you're smack dab <laughs> in the middle or close to the middle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let's start to turn towards how you get to history. At what point did you know, hey, I really like this history stuff. I want to do this more down the road. Well, I liked it when I had good teachers. when I had a good teacher when I was in uh, junior high who did local history and he was really engaged and loved it and took us out into the field and looked at archaeological sites and I liked that but then in high school I had a, a teacher who was not a good history teacher who just read from the book and made us memorize and it was very boring and then I didn't take up history again until I was an exchange student in Exeter University in England Okay. And at that point, I, I thought, well, I'd, I'd really liked European history, so I took all Europe, European history classes when mm -hmm. I was there, and that really turned me on to history. I, I loved it. I had great teachers, and um, I really liked the system they had over there where they would have a lecture and then a tutorial where you actually met one-on-one -on -one with a professor and you talk through things, and that was really engaging and exciting. So um, after that point, I decided I wanted to teach history. 
Yeah, and European history is so different in many ways from American history. I mean, the, the yeah. age alone of European history is much greater. Yes, yes. It, so it was a lot more in depth and, and a lot more than I had ever even known about. I had a class that I, even, I didn't even know that kind of history existed. It was called rural history. Sure. And it was a history of rural areas mm. and just kind of opened my eyes to what's left out of our normal history textbooks. Sure, yeah, the traditional Ben Franklin did this, Washington did this, but there's a whole lot of people that are un unnamed mm -hmm. uh, that, that are important to American history. Mm -hmm. So this was while you were still in high school, you did this exchange program? No, that was actually, I was a junior in college. Junior I didn't college. even have a major until I was a junior in college. Okay, and you're at Central, Central Michigan? Central Michigan University, yeah. Okay, so you're at Central Michigan, you're a junior in college, you go on this exchange program, you come back and you're sort of intellectually alive now. Mm -hmm. You major in history at that point? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you take, I guess, more classes in it and get Ye your degree in history. Yeah, and I, d I decided at that point I wanted to try teaching at high school level. So I did a social studies education major, and that took a year extra to do that. And um, at that point, they didn't have you out in the classrooms until you student taught. And once I got out and I started student teaching, I realized that there was so much more I wanted to learn about history. That I wanted to go back immediately. You know, I wanted. Mm. I felt like to be a good teacher, I needed to know more. But also, I realized that I, I wasn't really that comfortable teaching kids. I wanted to teach adults mm. that voluntarily were in my classroom sure. and and were more mature and prepared to learn. I didn't want to be a kind of a parent to students. I didn't want to babysit and deal with the disciplinary problems in sure. high schools. So then at that point I decided to go for my PhD. Great. And there's a great deal of intellectual freedom in the university that you don't have when a school board uh, you know, assigns a text, which yes. is what they have to do. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a, a lot more freedom, and not only in what you're able to talk about in the classroom and what books you want to include, but also freedom just in your time. Mm. Your, your time commitment mm. to be in a certain place at a certain time is far less at a university than it is in, in a, a high school. Of course, the time commitment for the extra things we do, like researching and reading and grading, we do that at home or wherever we want to do that. But it's that freedom to do it, do the work where we want to do it. Sure. And, and college students, uh, well, we hope, have a greater intellectual maturity to deal with difficult questions that uh, 16 year olds just can't deal with. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not capable of dealing with it. None of them are. Exactly, exactly. And so I, I, and I love college students too because they're at that crossover point in their lives where they're moving from, um, you know, into a more mature intellectual stage where they're ready to talk about deeper questions and really think very deeply about all kinds of issues that, that we deal with in, in the human sure. race. The 18 to 22 year range is an incredible, we, we see real differences in students in that time. Yes, that, the, the difference between a freshman at 18 and our graduating seniors is yeah. really amazing. Yeah. So you go back and you go back to Central Michigan again for your master's? Yes, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, they were just creating a joint PhD program in comparative history. And they were recruiting, actively recruiting students to, to come in with um, full tuition and, um, and extra benefits to basically pay us to go through this PhD program. Okay. So, and, and coming from a, a very big family with very meager income, sure. there was no way I could follow, you know, get a graduate degree without, you know, a scholarship. And so I was very grateful for that opportunity and, and I took it. Yeah. So that was my next question is, that, and you went from Central Michigan from basically start to finish of your PhD? Yes, except for the comparative element, we required us to study in um, Strathclyde University in Scotland okay. for at, at minimum of a year. Sure. Did you, uh, well, how did you find your Central Michigan education to be? Um, I think the undergraduate years were not as interesting to me as my graduate years. Graduate school is so much, it's just intrinsically more interesting mm -hmm. than undergraduate. Because undergraduate years, they, they make you a more well-rounded person with a holistic kind of education. And, and that means that you have to take courses that you're not that interested in. Mm -hmm. And as a graduate student, you specialize and you get to take courses in things that really interest you, that you love to read about and write about. And it, and it really, you, you can feel yourself growing intellectually as a graduate student. So that was, that was really wonderful 
to be there as a graduate student and I uh, had some great professors who were very good mentors mm -hmm. um, and, and so also a really good cohort of some friends who were going through the PhD program with me that we met and had coffee and, and, uh, and talked about all of these ideas so it was a great atmosphere. Sure and I think that's the one thing if, if you've never gone through graduate school or if you've never gone through a PhD program the people you're with are very meaningful um, you know I still keep up with my colleagues and I'm sure you do too. Yes, yes, definitely. And if you don't have good colleagues it's a pretty tough environment. You know, you're criticized all the time and graded and harshly in some cases. Yeah, yeah I think that it's really it's really important to have a good cohort of friends who are going through that experience with you and I think that I really benefited from that. I, and I know that there were, were one or two students that were in the graduate program who weren't part of the cohort because they lived off campus mm -hmm. and were commuting and they, so they wouldn't be able to meet with us on a regular basis and they, they struggled and it, actually all of them dropped out. It was mm -hmm. the cohort people that stuck it through because we helped each other. Wow. Um, did you have a, an undergraduate teacher that ended up becoming a graduate teacher as well? Yes. Yeah. What was the difference there? What was the experience like? Um, you know, it, it, there was a very slight dis di difference. My advisor as an undergraduate was um, an American history professor named Mitch Hall. And he's just a very laid back person and was very easy to deal with as an undergraduate, put you at ease, and he insisted we call him Mitch and not Professor Hall. <laughs> you know, that kind of a professor. And, and he became my advisor as a, as a graduate student as well. I just kept him as my advisor and he was great in giving me a lot of feedback a lot of time to improve my writing to improve my critical thinking skills um, giving me good books to read and really helped me through the whole program I think you know gave me just enough help and made me do a lot of things on my own so that at some points I would be frustrated with the demands he made mm. but in the end I realized that that all helped made made me a much stronger scholar well at at what point uh, did you know what you wanted to do your dissertation on? Because that's a, that's a big time. Yeah, I, I um, think I, at first I decided in my first year as a master's degree, I took a course that was on the social movements of the 60s. Uh -huh. And we had to do a research project for that course. And I knew that my Uncle Terry had been a student protester in the, in the Vietnam War era and that he had left college and helped to form a hippie commune in Michigan, in rural okay. Michigan. And, and, I, and I knew that there were always some tensions between him and my father. My father's very conservative. And so this would have been your father's brother? My father's youngest, or younger brother. Okay. And, um, and so that intrigued me and I wanted to know more about what hippies were really like, what a commune really was like. And, and, and I also had an image of a hippie as when I was growing up in the 70s, we made fun of hippies. You know, yeah. we, we thought that hippies were, you know, the men with long hair was just freakish and weird and, yeah. you know, wearing robes and smelling. We just thought they were really bizarre people. If you're going to San Francisco, wear a flower in your hair. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah that, that stereotype. And, and actually, as I started talking to the members of the commune, I, I interviewed most of them over the phone, a few in person. And I started reading more about the ideas of the hippie commune movement. I found out that it actually was grounded in some really solid analysis and evidence that they had brought from the social sciences to make a better community. So we, they had majors who were psychology majors, sociology majors, history majors, economics majors, mm -hmm. business majors that came to form the commune. And they actually brought their undergraduate and graduate educations, that knowledge with them to try and set up a better system of a community than what we had kind of just randomly formed in American mainstream society, a, an alternative to mainstream. And it really changed my view on, on the history of the hippies and the commune movement, number one. And, and that made me want to do my PhD dissertation on that field because very little had been written by historians about it. So it had been sort of a gap in the literature, I guess. Exactly, and, and so that got me interested in the 60s and the 70s. And then when I went to Scotland to do the second half of my master's degree um, at the University of Strathclyde, in, in British universities, they, they consider history basically everything before 1945. 
So things that are within, the people are still alive, mm -hmm. and things that happened within the last 50 years, they normally don't include in their classes. They don't bring history right up to today, and, it, and that's the traditional kind of way. There's obviously exceptions. But, um, so I, I couldn't do the communal movement in, and compare it from America to Britain like I wanted to do with my dissertation because that was too recent and it was, they didn't have anybody to supervise that aspect of my dissertation. So it, the compromise was to study the student protest movement in Britain and the United States and bring that back to the 1950s and 60s mm. so that um, Hamish Fraser was my supervisor in Scotland. He was, did, did some research on that era and so he did that supervision, and then Mitch Hall did the supervision of my research on the student protest movement here in the United States. Interesting. Yeah. Let's uh, stop right here. Right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about how Dr. Hefferly got to Wingate and uh, what she's doing now that she's here. Uh, join us for the second half. Thanks. Cigarette smoking and smokeless tobacco use are bad habits that have a negative effect on your oral health. The tar and nicotine from tobacco not only stain your teeth and cause bad breath, but can also lead to other health problems like gingivitis, leukoplakia, or even oral cancer. Gingivitis is the early stage of gum disease, which causes your gums to be tender, swollen, or bleed easily when flossing. Leukoplakia is a whitish, thick patch on your gums, tongue, or on the inside of your cheek that may lead to cancer. Other signs of possible oral cancer include numbness or difficulty in chewing or speaking. Take an active role in your oral health and choose to quit smoking. Your smile and your health will thank you. For the ADA Dental Minute, I'm Dr. Maria Lopez Howell. Welcome back. I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Wingate University. I'm joined here by Carrie Hefferly, Associate Professor of uh, History here at Wingate University. And uh, so now you have your PhD and you've been studying social movements and social protest uh, comparatively. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get to Wingate, North Carolina after living in Michigan almost your entire life by this point? <laughs> Well, I, once I had my PhD, I applied for jobs all over the country, and, and the, the, the opportunity, job opportunities for history PhDs are very narrow. There, there are not a lot of jobs, and there are a lot of PhD um, historians out there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people love history and, and get their PhDs in it, and so there, it's a lot of competition. So I just applied very widely, and I interviewed with a number of different universities. I interviewed with Wingate. Um, and I really, I really liked the position that they were, they were offering. They, it was right in my field. They wanted somebody to do um, an emphasis on American history and some world history and women's history, okay. which I had experience in and interest in. And I really liked the faculty that, that interviewed me. I, I felt very comfortable immediately with the faculty and the students. And I liked the small size of the university. I was very impressed with, with everything, really. So I, I felt like it was a natural move. Who was on your search committee, do you remember? Oh, yeah. I, I, I know that um, Professor Billinger was the head of the search committee. Um, let's see, um, Professor Prevo was on it. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other people that were on it. Oh, I can't remember it. The, Whoever it is, they didn't scare Nancy you off. Rand Nancy Randall was there. <laughs> and it was typical. I, they didn't, I don't think they introduced themselves as we're committee members or we're not. It was sure. more when we interview candidates, we have as many faculty members meet them as possible. That's right. Um, but That's I, I remember right. having good conversations with uh, those three. And then with, um, with Bob Billinger especially, he's such a funny person and a very engaging person, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and uh, his wife, Chris, was just wonderful. She's so kind and welcoming. You know, it really made me feel at home. Great, great. Uh, so you accept the Wingate position. Mm -hmm. You move to the southeast, mm -hmm. a rural uh, liberal arts uh, school. What was that transition like for you? You know, the the living in a rural area was was easy. Um, the hardest part for me, I think, was being 
so far from my family and friends. And I had done that before when I, when I lived in Scotland and in Exeter. So I was familiar with that. But being in the United States and so far from family and friends was odd. And, and also living in the South, which has its own culture mm -hmm. um, and, and, and some distinctive features, I have felt like an outsider in the South. And, and it, you know that, I think, made me feel a little isolated in some respects. Um, but you know, over the years, of course, I've made more friends and gotten more familiar with the area and felt more comfortable. Sure. And Charlotte itself is a city of outsiders. You know, that's, that's, yeah. it's an interesting culture yeah. uh, in terms of the people that you end up meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, uh, you're now at Wingate. Uh, you're kind of getting acclimated to the university. What, what classes are you teaching? How do you see yourself in the classroom, I suppose? What are you doing? Oh, I teach a lot of different kinds of classes. Um, I teach the women's history class, American women's history, U.S. history uh, all the way through, and I teach world history classes. Um, let's see, and I teach historiography, which is the um, kind of the history of the historical profession and okay. the different historical interpretations. And then this is the first semester that I've been teaching our history research methods class okay. where we help students develop a research topic and produce a paper that is publishable in a journal, in a scholarly journal. And that's been really interesting and different for me. So um, every year I learn new things. I feel like as a teacher I grow every year. I learn from my students and I, I'm always learning new things about history but also learning new things that students enjoy that students seem to learn a little bit better from and I, I'm constantly adjusting my classes and my reading schedule and and trying to adjust how I teach to, so that students learn better from me. Sure. Um, I don't know if, if I'm always successful in that and I think I probably sometimes am, you know in one class I'm better and in another class I, I just uh, for one reason or another kind of go backwards a little bit but so it's kind of always a fluid motion. You're sure. always growing as a, 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 you know, as a person. Yeah, and, and as we get older, things that aren't or don't seem like history for us, uh, the first Persian Gulf War, for example, or the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. that's history for them. And yeah. so we have to figure out how to interpret for them and, yeah. and relay that information. And constantly adjust for that. That's right. They, where they're not going to remember really anything in the 1990s. Yeah. When I say, you know, remember when the Berlin Wall fell? And the, no, they don't remember when the Berlin Wall fell. No one was born then. But. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned historiography, and I know you've just written a book about historiography. Tell me about that book, uh, what, how you got interested in this. And, you know. Well, when I first came to Wingate, one of the classes that they asked me to teach right in my very first semester was historiography. And it was a class that I had never taught before, and I actually never had a class that was specifically historiography. So it was a real challenge for me to learn how to teach this class. Mm. And, and I, I struggled in the first few years to really get a grasp on what I wanted to do in that class. And also I struggled because there wasn't a textbook, a standard textbook. Wingate is really good in creating innovative courses that are kind of cutting edge courses, like our Global Perspectives courses are really on the cutting edge of, of teaching history. And the same thing with historiography. It's um, a theoretical class that very often isn't, isn't required for undergraduates. And so it, the book came out of that process of trying to teach this material very challenging material to our history seniors and and not having a textbook there out there mm -hmm. not having syllabi that other professors had created and uh, there was no I, what I really wanted was a textbook that would explain the theories historical theories from like the ancient Greeks all the way through to modern day but also have really good extensive excerpts of histories written by those historians in those different ages mm -hmm. that students could read and, and, and help them to understand, oh, oh, this is how this theory is applied. So, and there was nothing like that. And, and there still is nothing like that except for my book. So that was what, my, um, what I was looking for. And, and I had gone from one publisher to another asking, do you have a book like this? This is what I need for this class. And finally, um, Pearson uh, Publishing said, why don't you write it? You know, you've, you've been teaching this and you need it. Others probably need it. So uh, I signed a contract with them and, 
and it took me about five years to put the, the book together because I could only really do it in my vacations. Mm -hmm. And um, but I got some some uh, funding, some support from Wingate. We have a Spivey scholarship or, or uh, instructorship where we have a course reduction to work on it, and I did that. And I had a sabbatical last year that I just finished up the, the last revisions of the book, and it came out this summer, in July of 2010. Congratulations! Thanks. Have the students received it well, or have you been able to use it yet? Yeah, I use I use it in the fall, okay. and and they seem to like it. I asked them about it, and and they seem to think it was pretty clear. And <laughs> I've I've gotten they're an interesting position, though. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hard to I I, I wanted, I didn't want to put pressure on them, and you know I'm not sure that they would have been honest in telling me if it was really bad, um, but yeah, they they seem to learn from it and and seem to to be able to understand it. Great, we have a little bit of time left, and one of the things that's that's interesting to me is. You've done a lot of uh, writing and research on protest movements, student movements, and the place of, of a college campus in sort of protest, mm -hmm. right? And in American history, the college campus might be the, the exclusive source of protest in some ways. So talk to me about, uh, I don't know, how you view college and its relationship to activism, I suppose, at least in your research or even in your own sort of opinion. Well, there, there are, um, activism is actually widespread, but college protests, especially in the 60s, became very sensational and widely covered in the press, more so than all of the protests that were happening with other groups, outside adult groups, older people's groups, and even younger people's groups. Because the, the campus protests, um, very often universities are sponsored by taxpayers and public universities, and so of course taxpayers are concerned about what's going on in the institutions they fund especially. Um, so that's I think one reason that, that newspapers covered them a little bit more in depth. But also because universities had been so quiet really in the earlier half of the 20th century um, that the, the country was unaccustomed to seeing university students having a demonstration march, and especially white college students protesting when most of the country thought that white college students had the least to be, you know, protesting about. That the white college students were upper middle class, they were privileged elite to be in university in the first place. And so I think that for, for journalists and for the wider public, it was shocking to them that people that they thought were coddled and they thought had everything were the ones who were speaking out against their country, who had given them everything. Yeah. And so I think it's the shocking, sensational nature of college protests that, that makes people think that most protests happen in colleges, when, when actually it's just that the, the newspaper coverage devoted most of their attention to the college protests. Yeah, and you can see, uh, if you look at an old college yearbook, the men are in shirts and ties, and then like somewhere in 68 or 69, they're not wearing shirts and ties anymore. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to me. And actually some students had to fight for that right to dress as they wanted to. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that inspired a lot of protests were all of the campus regulations governing student behavior from you know, how they dress to you know, when they ate and when they had to go to bed, mm. um, who they could date. There were all kinds of regulations that they actually had protests to make universities drop those in local parentis rules. Interesting. Well, uh, I've enjoyed our conversation today with, uh, with Dr. Hefferly. Um, next week uh, on Wingate Spotlight, we're going to probably have Dr. Aaron Cully, who's an associate professor of sociology, and talk a little bit about his teaching, his research, and how he uh, got here from Indiana. So, Carrie, thanks for being here. Thank you. And thank you for watching uh, Wingate Spotlight.